One reason that I say that the exponential function is the key is that it unlocks so many other functions. Let's take a look at a few functions that you may not have seen before, or you may, but which involve the exponential. First up, the Gaussians. These are also known as bell curves. You may have seen it under that guise before. The standard Gaussian has the formula 1 over square root of 2 pi times e to the minus x squared over 2. You see that exponential in there? Yeah. This is a Gaussian with zero mean and unit standard deviation. Very, very useful. Now, of course, when I say zero mean and unit standard deviation, these are things that we can change. A more general Gaussian is given by 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus quantity x minus mu squared all divided by 2 sigma squared. Here mu is the mean of this Gaussian and sigma is its standard deviation. Now as you might guess by the language that I'm using, this comes from probability. These Gaussians arise as probability densities and are absolutely vital when talking about probability and its applications in prediction, in planning, all over science. Boy, do you need Gaussians. We're going to see these guys later, especially when we do multivariable calculus. But for now, well, I want you to have at least seen these functions and see that they depend on the exponentials, as does the ERF function. ERF of x is a sigmoid function with a particular s sort of shape. It has the formal definition as the integral as t goes from 0 to x of e to the minus t squared dt. So the function itself is defined in terms of a definite integral. Now you may be wondering to yourself, why don't we just do that integral? Why do we have to define it in terms of this? Why not just integrate this and then there we go, that's erf of x. Well, we'll talk about that later, much later. But for now, let me just say that this function is best defined in terms of this integral of this exponential function. You might see something like a Gaussian hiding in there. That's your first clue that this function is very useful in probability and statistics, where it may have something to do with errors. Hmm. Now that's not the only function defined in terms of integrals. The all-important gamma function also has a definite integral as its basis. The gamma function is called, of course, gamma of x, and that is the integral as t goes from 0 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 times e to the minus t dt. Now, this too is something where you might wonder, why don't we just do that? <laughs> it's not so easy. Now, this function is amazing. It's all over the place. It has so many cool properties, perhaps the most amazing of which is that gamma of x plus 1 equals x times gamma of x. Hmm, where have I seen a function that does something like that before? Oh, that's right. This is kind of like the factorial function, right? n plus 1 factorial is really n plus 1 times n factorial? Yes. And because gamma of 1 is 1, what we get in the end is like a shifted factorial function. Gamma of n plus 1 is really n factorial for all positive integers n, but this function extends to all positive real numbers as well. Now, you may not see it from its appearance, from its definition, but this gamma function, oh man, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. It arises in high dimensional geometry. It arises in data analysis. It comes up in number theory. It comes up in harmonic analysis. It comes up in combinatorics. It comes up just everywhere. The gamma function is ubiquitous, especially when you start talking about other classes of special functions that are just all over the place in mathematics, a lot of which they're very difficult to define explicitly. Now, what do I mean by that? Here is one class of functions, the elliptic functions, the Jacobi elliptic functions, as opposed to the Weierstrass elliptic functions. And these depend on a parameter c that is somewhere between 0 and 1. The basic Jacobi elliptic functions are Sn and Cn. 
Now again, these are functions of x with a parameter c. Now, how do we pronounce this? I, I don't know. I say s n and c n. Some people say sun and kun or sin and kin or san and can. I don't know, but s n and c n are supposed to remind you of the sine and cosine functions. And in fact, when c is zero, these collapse to the sine and cosine function respectively. Well, what happens when I turn the dial from c going to 0 to c going to 1? Well, in the limit where c goes to 1, I get the hyperbolic functions, hyperbolic tangent and hyperbolic secant, respectively. So what this looks like, if you graph them out, is in the 1 limit, you have sine and cosine, right? That's when c equals 0. If you turn the dial up to c equals 1, you get hyperbolic tangent and hyperbolic secant. And then for a typical c in between, you're just going back and forth between these two. It's a nice, smooth interpolation. Now, these elliptic functions have so many cool properties. For example, surprise, sn squared plus cn squared equals 1, just like sine and cosine. Aha. Just like hyperbolic tangent and hyperbolic secant. Aha. These functions are very useful in physics. For example, they are used to give explicit solutions to the equations of motion of a nonlinear pendulum, the way that it traces out something sort of elliptic. Very interesting. Similar applications to water waves, all kinds of other physical things. Speaking of waves, the Bessel functions are incredibly useful in talking about the physics of waves. These come in four different families, j sub alpha, y sub alpha, i sub alpha, k sub alpha, each of which, again, has a parameter alpha that can be anything you want. These functions, very complicated, very hard to write down explicit definitions of, but they are very useful. We will see them later when we talk about vibrating membranes, where we talk about rotating chains, things like this. Those are the Bessel functions. There are so many other families of special functions. All of the ones that we've seen here, all of the functions that we've seen are very, very special examples of one very general class called hypergeometrics. The hypergeometric functions are an enormous and intricate class with an intricate and unfriendly notation of 2f1 a, b, c, z. You got all these parameters, and a, b, and c, and then all these subscripts, 2 and 1, and what are we going to do? Oh, dear. I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. Do we really need to know all of these functions? Do I have to memorize all this stuff? No. Relax. Don't stress out. Don't worry about these. Knowing the details of these functions? Nope. Not necessary. This is merely an introduction, so that in the future, if we run across anything from these families, you'll recognize the names, and you'll have some sense of how useful they are. The whole point of this chapter is to review some of the core basic functions that we definitely need, exponentials, trigs, logs, things like that but also to show that there are many, many more functions in the world which can be very interesting and very useful.